Uh, my name is Dr. Paul Brennan from uh, the medical school. I'm also the vice chair for UCU uh, in Cardiff. So, yes, please. Please. Uh, so, let me just turn over my notes here. Okay. So, the first thing I would like to do is introduce people that clearly need little or no introduction. Uh, and I want to thank Colin Reardon, the vice chancellor, for coming to speak with us today. So, a big round of applause, please, for Colin. Colin has also brought with him, and maybe not everybody knows, is Ros Williams, his Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so today's session is going to be chaired by myself and Nikki Perot from, this, from uh, Law, a professor in Law. And uh, the plan is for our event to take about an hour. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to make a few housekeeping announcements. We're not expecting a fire alarm. So if there is a fire alarm, there's a door behind you there and the fire door here. There's a small exit here as well, but that will be, uh, I'll be running out that one. <laughs> the other thing is if you can put your phones on silent so that we're not hit by too many retweets, that would be great. Um, and then I wanted to tell you a bit about the format for today. Uh, we have questions that were being submitted in advance by you. And we had about 70 or 80 questions, I think, in all. And various people have worked very hard over the weekend. People have been working very hard for, for the union over the last two or three weeks. And uh, it's very hard for the weekend to try and skillfully put those together into about 11 questions. Uh, and, and various individuals have been tasked with asking those questions. So what's going to happen is uh, we will, as the chair, Nikki will do it, uh, we'll invite an individual to ask a question. Then we'll invite the vice chancellor to respond. If the Vice Chancellor doesn't give a robust enough response, then we as chairs may invite him to elaborate on that, um, and then we'll move on to the next question. Uh, as I say, I'm going to put a timer on this because I think uh, we're very, very grateful for uh, the Vice Chancellor to come, but I think it's not fair not to have a time limit. So I'm going to put a timer on this for an hour, and I'm pressing time now. And I'm going to hand over to Nikki to get started with the first question. Thank you, thank you again, and thank you very much, Paul. Come on, we've got a set of 11 questions, and the first one, oh, the first one, the first one is from Sam, um, and he's a student in Share. Yeah. Um, Katie and Walters and I created a petition aimed towards you, expressing concern for staff and students alike during the strike. We've achieved one over 6,100 signatures, but we'd like to know that we never received a response from you. Okay, uh, yes, I'm sorry it's taken so long, <coughs> you can hear me if I do this. I am sorry it's taken so long. And uh, let me just start by saying that, you know, I, I do understand the, the impact this is having. I know that you staff don't want to be on strike. I know we, none of us want to be sitting in this hall having this conversation. You know, it's not a good situation to be in. I know that all your uh, teachers uh, and my colleagues uh, are not trying to cause damage to your education. It's an unfortunate byproduct of the situation we're in. So, just having said that, um, uh, I'm sorry it has taken so long, but we have now uh, prepared a reply, which I think will be going out today, or at least very, very soon. So we are going to reply to that. Um, and uh, we have been replying to emails uh, from students. I haven't replied personally to those because there's just too many of them. I think it's 274, 275, I got them just before. Um, but I have been trying as far as I can to reply personally to staff when they write me. And I might, I might have miss, missed the odd one. Uh, obviously, the numbers are much smaller by, by comparison, so I've managed to do that. Are you happy with the response? Last second, yeah. What is the response? Would you like to tell us a bit about what that response is like to be told? Uh, well, I think it will be uh, along the lines that we're going to do everything that we possibly can, as we have been sending this message out anyway, everything that we possibly can to uh, mitigate the effects and make sure that you don't suffer detriment or that no student suffers detriment. I mean, obviously there's a limit to what it would be possible to do, um, given the, uh, it, well, it depends how long this all goes on for, there will be a limit, but we'll, we'll do whatever we can. And the idea is that we want to give you the, possibility, the chance to demonstrate that you've achieved the learning outcomes that you're supposed to achieve in your modules and in all your assessments, and we'll do our level best to achieve that. I know that everybody will, will, will want that to happen. Okay, on that point, thank you very much. Can I turn to Natalie, who's another student um, from the School of Law and Politics, Natalie Warren. Hello, Natalie. My name is Natalie, I'm 
My question is one we've all been asking for the past two weeks, and that is, given that our lecturers are not getting paid for the days they're striking, and we, the students, are not getting any refunds for the missed teaching, where is this money going, or where is it going to go? Thank you. Okay, so <coughs> we, we don't yet know that. <laughs> Indeed, very good question. We don't, we don't yet know what the dimensions of this are all going to be, or what the effects of it are all going to be. Um, but the default position is that uh, the money will stay with the, with the academic schools or, or with the departments uh, that, that would then retain it. And I think, you know, we, we will then consider what we'll, need, what we'll need to do to um, restore the position as far as we can. So that might mean, uh, you know, there may be costs involved in, in um, doing what I was talking about before in terms of the students. So, but it's really difficult to say right now what that will be. So I think we, we need to wait and see what the outcome of all this is. And, and when it's done, we can, then, we can then deal with that. We also had two other questions which came in on a related issue to Natalie's question. Um, and they were sent to the chair. One was a suggestion that perhaps those um, monies might be invested in mental health support for students. Um, was someone noting that there's been a quite startling rise in um, students accessing counselling services last year, 1,700 people accessing services. And the second suggestion was, um, or the question, why can't those monies go to the Union Hardship Fund to help staff who are experiencing financial hardship in exercising their legal right to protest? So those are two questions. You know, I could think of a whole range of issues. Mental health is a really important one. And I don't think we should be saying, if we need to spend money on mental health, this has to be the money. I think we should find the money to, to spend on that, and we do, and we have expanded services uh, as much as we can. Um, you know, it's never enough. You know, I, I know it's never enough. That is actually one of the issues that we're facing here. Um, we've, uh, you know, we're in a situation where, in, certainly in, in Welsh universities, we're in a very, very tight period right now. Um, and we'll probably come on to this later, but I'm hoping uh, that as we move through into the new world of, of the post-diamond review, that, that funding will improve, but the situation for us is really quite constrained at the minute. So it's never going to be enough, whatever we do. Um, I agree that mental health is a, is a good use for that money. I think, um, as for the Union Hardship Fund, I, I would have thought that's really a matter for the Union, rather than the University. Okay, can I call on Vicky Wass to <coughs> ask her question? And Vicky's from the School of Business. Uh, yes, USS was launched in 1975 because the pension benefits in the predecessor scheme, um, effectively a defined contribution scheme, were too low for members to live on. Vice Chancellor, you claim that the current, uh, current pension benefits under USS are unsustainable. If they're unsustainable for a multi employer organisation, which can share and manage risk much more effectively and cheaply than can individuals, are not they more unsustainable when transferred to individuals? Is history repeating itself? Will we be the people that can't afford to live on our pensions? see how we can maintain the level of benefits that uh, the defined benefit scheme we now have uh, produces. It's obviously since 2011 that that level has already gone down. Um, the last two valuations of the, of the fund that we had uh, resulted, well, in, in two things. Uh, contributions have gone up from 14% employers, 16% employers, now to 18%, and similarly it's risen for members as well. And the level of benefits has gone down um, in 2014. The final salary element was closed, and that was turned into a career average v, a v value defined benefit uh, element, and the salary cap was reduced to 55,000. So that all reduced the benefits. The, the problem is just the afford affordability of all of this. Um, and uh, you know, if there is a way, if there is a way of affording, you know, the, the sort of level of benefits that we have now, if that could be done, 
let's say, by finding a different way of valuing the scheme that's acceptable to the pensions regulator and that's acceptable to the USS trustee, um, both of whom obviously have a, a legal or fiduciary duty to make sure that uh, the risk is, is manageable in their eyes, not our eyes, uh, then that would be great. And you know, we should do that if that is possible. But it doesn't, at the moment, so far, seem to have transpired to be possible. And the question just then becomes, you know, what do we then do about those escalating costs? Because, uh, as I've said in you know, at least one or two probably emails, the cost would have to go up, or the contributions between members and universities would have to go up by over 11% to keep the level of benefits where, where they are now. And that is the basic problem that we, that we face. Um, uh, you know, as far as the university is concerned, that would be over 7% rise in our cost base, which, which would have really major effects. Uh, I, I said that we're in a, a tight period at the moment. I know the Welsh Government is doing its, really is doing its best to support universities, and they've, they've reformed the student support system and the, and the um, uh, funding system. That will start coming into force in 2018-19, and will over the subsequent three years then start building up, and we hope we'll get somewhere back to the funding levels that we had. But only a couple of years ago, we were getting 65 million from the HEFCU, and it's now near less than 45. I think we've lost, four, we lost 14 million this year. Um, I understand why that is. I haven't complained about it. You know, they're doing their best. They've got huge pressures on them. They've got the health service, other things. Um, it means that in this university, and I cannot speak for Cambridge or Manchester or Glasgow, right? They have to speak for themselves. In this university, what I've been trying to do is to get through this period of, of, of real financial constraints without causing a big fuss and demanding a load of money for the Welsh Government, which they haven't got and, and can't really give us, and they're going to try and get, get through to, to the point where they can, uh, and also without doing anything drastic in the university. You know, um, I, I don't want to have to take drastic measures to get through this period, and if we have a big rise in costs, that's going to become extremely difficult. You know, it's very tight as now. <coughs> Rob, you want to add something on that? Well, I, 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 only just to add, I mean, I think, I think the question um, that we've all got to address is, is how do we make sure that we provide uh, the best possible pension going forward with the resources that we've got? And I think everyone will recognise that the environment that we're in at the moment is still very tight, and we've got to try and find a way through that. Um, I'd like to pass across to Dr. Wing Wong from the School of Business as well. Sorry, I do my best here. I'm not very good in speaking. Uh, basically, the I think the problem is the actual team for uh, our pension scheme that the method they use is flawed, mm -hmm. right? If you They are ultra conservative, and one practitioner pensioner described it as idiotic. <laughs> um, this is not my word. And, and basically, if you look up the, the pension regulations, you, you, there are two approaches, right? One is what they are using, Duke Plus. And then because of QE, the interest rate is very low, right? And that really overstates the amount of deficit you have. And secondly, you can also have this alternative, which is use the best estimate of the return on assets. That is sensible because that is the return that's going to pay off the future liabilities. Yeah. And American pensions, defined benefit pensions in America, they can use that across the Atlantic. We, you know, so, so there is this alternative. to the pensions regulator and to the USS trustees to go down that route, if that can be done, rather than, I know, I know what you're saying, you're saying that uh, there's, there's, the, there's basically this question of, 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 of a sudden de-risking and having to put all those, the 70% that are now in, in assets, to put that into guilt, which obviously would have a very low yield, uh, or at least uh, uh, for, for, the, for the scheme. Um, and therefore, it's an ultra-conservative, it's an ultra-low risk way of proceeding. Uh, I certainly, we have never been asked to comment on that, um, on how the, the pension scheme is valued or how that's done. If that is a way of solving this, I'm, that I'm all for it. You know, why not do it? Back to Rune on this for a second. 
Sorry, I, I don't want to pick up the time. Okay, the, 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 the uh, average salary scheme we have is fantastic. I woke up, that one only costs about 1% above inflation to fund. With that scheme, the contribution rate can come down by about 4 to 6%. Right? That means you can only pay about 14%, we can pay something like 6%. Well, that'd be actually fantastic. Yeah, and then I can give me, if you give me a bit of time and the data I need, I can show, I can prove, right, with peer reviews and you know, all these scrutinies that the, 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 the method used by our actual team is flawed. You know, I'll tell you what, if you have all the portfolios made, uh, uh, consist of guilds, you have larger, higher inflation risk. Why? Because let's say the inflation now is 3%, you buy a, 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 a guild that gives you 3% of interest. It doesn't mean that the, the, the inflation rate is not there. The, infl the inflation next year can be higher, right? Whereas stocks in the long term, secure uh, equities, Proven to hedge a good hedge against inflation. So, Vice Chancellor, is there a way that you can bring our local knowledge to bear on these problems? Because that's really one of the things that we would like to see happen. Sadly thwarted by the snow last Thursday, but I hope that will meet as soon as possible. And, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want that solution? I mean, if, if, if it is genuinely the case, and then we can we can show that the methodology is flawed, and there's a better way of doing it that's within the rules and and, and within the law, and is acceptable to the regulator, regulator and the trustee. I can't think of any reason why one wouldn't do that. I mean, it would be great. Yeah. Yes, I, know. I don't know. I honestly do not know well, you why. Should have done. Why not? Please. 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 Uh, we're not in a position for shouting or heckling particularly. We're trying to set this up as a respectful environment, okay? So please. <laughs> I've given my personal assurance to the Vice Chancellor as, a, as, a, as the Chair of UCU that if this does become personal and unpleasant, we will leave, okay? And the meeting will be called to a halt, so please. Okay, we have two questions which rather touch on the questions around the funding deficit. And for the purposes of time, I'm going to skip ask them, but thank you very much to the people who asked those questions regarding the phantom deficit. Two of them both actually concern the question of how you would utilise the expertise from the School of Business um, around the phantom deficit and asking you directly whether you felt those experts were wrong. The um, other suggested that in relation to the huge number of experts across the sector who are saying that the phantom deficit is indeed phantom, in words that a nine-year-old could understand, would you care to revise your original position? Yeah. <laughs> the question that's been posed by one of the lecturers is essentially saying that, in, so far as there's so much out there um, by experts, by economists, statisticians, um, saying that the deficit is in fact phantom, it's constructed, in words that nine-year-olds could understand with videos now pouring out on the internet, and with economists, forming very, very large groups saying that this deficit has been constructed and it's a political manifestation rather than something which is actually real, would you now care to change your position in terms of your well, position that, that you was, that been, yeah. I, Well, I, what, what I said is it's not really up to me, it's up to the pensions regulator. And I've said that all along, I said that from the beginning when I first sent out an email in November that the pensions regulator is a, is a key player in this... Uh, in this issue, and if it's acceptable to the pensions regulator, and the pensions regulator can be persuaded that this new methodology is, or this alternative methodology is correct, and I can completely see the logic of it. I've read the, you know, the article. Uh, was it by a, a professor at UCL or somewhere, or Imperial maybe, um, on this? And I can absolutely see the, the the sort of financial economic logic of of what's being said there about risk. But that isn't up to me. That's up to the pensions regulator, and. Well, I don't know how I support that. Sorry, so, making this a conversation between us now. Yeah. I've heard that the it's not up the pension regulator wasn't the one to choose the valuation and that that was down to the USS yeah. trustees. And I don't know. <laughs> No, no, the pension regulator wouldn't choose the method of valuation. I'm not a trustee's proposer 
a method evaluation. But if there is another one, you know, if they can be prevailed upon to choose a different one that is acceptable with Benjamin's regulator and has, you know, would reduce contributions to 14%, I mean, we'd be absolutely delighted with that. <laughs> and so would all of you, because you'd all came from that too. So if that can be done, that would be great. Well, then come out in support of it, like other VCs. I just have. Yeah. Yeah. Come out in support of it, like other VCs have. Other I just have. Just ask. Okay, so is that the two other related questions, just to, um, just to kind of um, tidy this part up. Um, two people have asked questions separately, asking about the steps you took. Um, to investigate whether these changes to pension were necessary. So, for example, did you contact members of the business school for their opinion and advice? And also the extent to which you consulted with the university executive board um, in, to, in compiling a response to the USS survey in September 2017. Uh, no, no, I didn't um, contact members of the business school about the detail of that, if that's what was the question. Yeah. I think that's quite clear, I didn't. Um, on the response to the U U USS survey, uh, that was asking the senior management team to respond. Um, and so we gave a senior management team response and we did discuss it at UEB. Unfortunately, the timing was such that we had to send in the response before, on the Friday, before the UEB on the Monday, but we uh, just simply said to them, it's subject to discussion and we might have to come back. But we did discuss it quite extensively, as we always do. I mean, this is a, actually a, a regular thing, you know, it's not the only time this has happened. We get these surveys on, on, on various matters and we're asked to respond as a, as a management team and, and we do that and we, we did on this occasion as well. And we did discuss it at UEB. Thank you very much. And Andy Williams, Dr Andy Williams from Journalism. <coughs> Vice Chancellor, thank you for coming today. Um, in an open letter to you on the, the 1st of March, it was put to you that an average 45% pension cut for us is equivalent to a 17% pay cut for staff. Now, your own pay and pensions contributions have risen substantially in recent years, and, and the Cardiff University website makes clear that, that your pay is linked to your performance. The, the same is true of other UK vice chancellors. So my, my question is this, if, if you're worth it, why aren't we? Well, I mean, I, I, I do think you're worth it. I do think you're worth it. And anything that happens with USS will affect me too. I'm in, I'm in USS as well, so, you know, I'm not going to there was actually a question about um, your pension scheme. Um, someone has asked, um, how much of your USS pension will you lose as a consequence of the decision to discontinue defined benefits in relation to future contributions, Vice Chancellor? Uh, well, I suppose the same as everybody, I think. <laughs> It's, it's a bit uneven depending on the, sal the salary how much people are going to The question that was also, it came with a bit of a blurb alongside it, and I, because I'm not an economist or a pension expert, I don't know, but we've been told that for those who have, um, who have contributions of 1.8, I can't remember, million banked, essentially, right. that it no longer is tax efficient to have their contributions, employer contributions going into that, so then they receive it as cash in lieu. I'm not doing that. I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. So and your employer I'm contributions continue to go into the USS yes, pot? Yes, it's not, it's not tax efficient. I mean, it, it gets heavily taxed. But that just goes into, into tax, which is quite right. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, related questions. Um, yeah, it follows on from Andy's question. Um, junior colleagues, or those starting out a career in academia, stand to lose the most in their USS supplement retirement. Those with only a few years inside the guaranteed final salary scheme are hit much harder than older academics who will have their long years <coughs> of service and entitlements in the USS protector. So it's more of a comment, really, about mm. intergenerational injustice. I think that's right. Okay, so then I'm going to call upon um, Lydia Hayes from Law and Politics. 
Hello. <laughs> like many other lecturers, my annual salary is about 42,000 a year. If I remain working at Cardiff until I retire, I will have given 28 years continuous service. Being part of USS meant I could expect an income of 15,000 a year in my old age. Expert analysis predicts this income will now fall from 15,000 to 7,100 pounds a year. Vice Chancellor, do you think this is fair? in any way applauding pensions cuts. I don't want cuts to pensions. What we have to, what I, what I am concerned with is ensuring that, that, that the university can actually afford to fund the best pension possible. And that's the issue we're facing here. It's not, it's not that somehow anybody's in favour of cutting pensions or thinks it's a good thing. It's a, you know, it's not a good thing, clearly. It's not anything anybody wants. The question is, how do we actually solve this? You know, how do we solve this without a big increase in costs that the university can't afford and that you know, that, that people probably don't have to, have to accept themselves. So that, that is the issue, and perhaps the valuation methodology is the best way forward on this, because if, in, if that really is doable, and if, if, if it, what I don't quite understand is, is why the, the, the pensions regulator has, has not so far, uh, or has so far, continuously said that actually the risk is too high, which they have. There was a proposal last autumn by USS, which the pensions regulator basically sent back and saying, uh, saying that actually you're taking too much risk. So that would be something well worth looking at. I mean, we, we can't go into it all now, the detail of that, but that would be something for the group to look into and, uh, and, and understand better, I think. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Okay, there's uh, another question which we've sent in for the um, chairs to ask. It's a delightful thing. Um, this question is, how can it be the case, Vice Chancellor, that the university can afford to fund a series of prestigious building projects when there is supposedly not enough money to make sure that staff are able to retire on a pension above poverty level. Yes, it, it, it is a good question. Well, the answer is that when you uh, invest in, in building projects, you're also going to fill those buildings with, with people who are doing things, and that actually brings a return. So there's what about investing in people? Uh, that, 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 that then brings a, a return and so that you can then uh, cover the costs of, of the investment. Now, that's different from just a rising costs, unfortunately, it is. Um, and in fact, the, I mean, Rob can say a little bit about uh, the situation with, the, um, uh, you know, with, with our investments at the moment, but actually it's quite helpful to us to, to be able to invest for the future and make sure that this university is secure and strong into the future, because if it isn't, we all have a really big problem, and, and, and we've lost again through the changes that happened which, uh, you know, to, to the way that, that universities are funded. We used to get maybe 15 million a year in capital funding, we just don't get that anymore. And if you, if you stop investing, if you just let things slide and don't maintain and refurbish and don't replace buildings or, or put in new equipment and so on and so forth. If you don't do that, you really do end up on the slide. And previously, we'd get a grant to, grant to do that. We, we don't get that anymore. So we have to make sure that we can do all this uh, uh, ourselves. And it is, you know, the idea of, of it is that it is for the benefit of the university, it's for the benefit of students, and it's for the benefit of staff, of research staff and teaching staff. I don't know if you want to add anything to that at all. Well, only to say, I think, that um, the, the, the university, in order to make sure that uh, it continues to be at the forefront, uh, needs to continue to invest. The investments that we're making are one-off investments as opposed to ongoing investments. Um, and uh, the intent is that those investments would generate returns for the university that would uh, exceed the cost of actually uh, the, the money that the university has borrowed to pay for those investments. I suppose the flavour of the question is really, the, so we're losing the 15 million um, capex um, and then choosing to invest, borrow quite substantial sums of money to put towards 450 million um, investment programmes into buildings. 
and yet there are lecturers who are going to be left with £7,000 to live on a year. The question is about what we're investing in, people or buildings, and, and a lot of people are given the sense that it's a preference towards structures rather than people. Well, the, 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 well, the, the, the staffing at this university, is inc we've increased by about 1,000 people you know, since I came here. We've got 1,000 extra jobs in this university. So what I'm really concerned about is making sure that we, we stay on that track of uh, keeping people, you know, keep, keeping the university on an, a reasonable and, and, and manageable expansion trajectory and not getting into a position where we find ourselves in such a difficult financial situation that we simply can't carry on with that. And that's, that's the main thing that's uppermost in my mind. And, you know, I, I understand the, uh, the, you know, the detriment of this move on pensions. It's just a question of how do we resolve it. And I, I have tried to say that all along. Like, you know, nobody's saying this is a good thing. Um, and, oh, I'm just repeating myself here. Given the importance of the staff viewpoint and how people feel, I'd like to call on Dr. Rob Thomas from Biosci to ask the next question, which I think goes to the heart of this. Thanks. Hello, Colin. I'm one of your senior lecturers. Given that Cardiff University relies very heavily on staff working long hours of unpaid overtime, what are you planning to say or do to maintain the goodwill of your staff and to motivate them to resume providing this unpaid overtime, given that we're in effect being given a massive future pay cut? how things pan out um, as to what I can do to regain your goodwill. I'm very sorry that I've lost it. I never ever, I really didn't want to do that. What I wanted to do was to be as, as, as clear as I could that this is going to be difficult and that there's no easy way through it. And I still don't know what the easy way is. I mean, unless, unless, it, is, unless it is my evaluation route. So, you know, I was hoping to do, and obviously failed in this, but I was hoping when I um, sent my email out at the end of November, was, was to set out these issues and not, as it were, build up hope that this, this is going to be easy. It is extremely difficult um, because we just have to square this circle of, of, of what is affordable uh, and what is what is viable and what can be, you know, what we can actually achieve. Now, if there is an answer to it all, then then it will be wonderful, and nobody more delighted than. Well, I expect a lot of people would be more delighted than I would, but I will be as delighted as anybody else if we do find a way through this that doesn't involve big rising costs, that does protect pensions, uh, and that is acceptable to everybody concerned. I mean, I really want that to happen. But I didn't want to get, you know, start out by saying, there's a, there's, a, there's a way of doing this. We can pay a little bit more money. That will solve it. it. It wasn't true then, and it isn't true now, I don't think. <coughs> Thank you, um, Vice Chancellor. Related to that point is this whole question uh, that has been at the back of many people's minds due to the Freedom of Information Act around the decision, the, the response to the survey in September 2017. And that's that that decision was perhaps made without consultation with your staff and without a full and deep understanding of the antagonism that was going to result from the subsequent uh, UUK position. Would you like to comment on that? Because we would propose that that would be an alternative way of going forward in general. Well, the September 2017 survey was about what can you afford? Um, and we said we really can't afford a rising cost. The proposal didn't come through until December. Uh, so, you know, the September 2017 survey was one thing and the, and the rising costs, which was about the rising costs. Um, and the only option open to us at that point was to say, well, if you don't want a rising cost, the, the only thing available is, uh, is, is moving to direct contribution. So that's what we said. Uh, I would like to follow it up. So there was also one question in the survey that asked if, um, if the contribution cost would rise, would the majority of your USS members leave the scheme? 
and Cardiff University's answers to that was yes. Now, I haven't been asked, and I don't think anybody else in this room has been asked. So it seems to me that would have been nice, um, or perhaps necessary, to consult with staff on what their intentions and their preferences are. Preferences are. <laughs> And the way we consider that was to look at what people had actually done. Uh, so at the moment, there is the, op the option to pay an extra 1%, mm -hmm. and only 15% of people have done that. So that seemed then reasonable to, to, de to deduce from that, that if only 15% wanted to increase their contributors by 1%, it would be unlikely that people would want to in uh, in increase their con contributions by more than that. Uh, and clearly, you know, that's the best result. Well, yeah. But that, that was the that was the uh, um, the thought process that we had. So that's the answer to the question. There will be time at the end of this meeting to open up questions to the floor. All right. So, um, can I call upon Professor Loredana Lepsi from the School of Modern Languages, please? Okay. After all this, can you confirm to us, I mean, hand on heart, and with the interests of the whole university community at, uh, in mind? and that includes staff and student, that you are personally convinced by the UK's position on the future of the pension scheme? What I'm, what I'm convinced by is that we can't handle a big increase in costs, and the, the only way it, at the moment that it looks as if that's achievable is uh, by the direct contribution scheme. Having said that, having said that um, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased, and I've, I've always said there's more time for discussion. If you look back in my emails, uh, I think there was one on the 10th or sometime in February, and before that, you know, I said there's still plenty of time for discussion, and there is. Um, I've never been against further discussions, which, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned it several times. And so, you know, UUK and UCU are discussing it probably as we speak, but certainly today, under the auspices of the ACAS. And if that then comes up with uh, a solution that's better than the one on offer, that's more acceptable to everybody, I'd, I'd be absolutely, uh, I'd obviously welcome that if, if, if that is the case. So we'll have to see. Okay, can I call upon Dr. Stephen Stanley from the School of Social Sciences? Please. <coughs> Um, I've been a lecturer in the School of Social Sciences for 15 years. I'm a 40-year-old married man. If the proposed changes to pensions go ahead, my pension will be cut from £20,000 per year to £8,000. University staff pay growth has been fixed around 1% since 2009, reducing our incomes by 17% in real terms. By contrast, in 2014, the highest paid executive at the USS Pension Scheme received a 50% increase to £900,000 per year. And currently, two USS staff earn more than £1 million per year. As our Vice Chancellor, what will you do to address these gross inequalities and will you stand up for your staff and fight with us for the pensions that we deserve? Should, we should uh, embrace it. As for USS and the um, executive of USS, their, their conditions will be set by the board. There are, I think, three UCU members on the board. Um, and, you know, it's really a question of uh, who is going to run. I mean, who do you want running a 65 or 68 billion 
pound pension schemes and what are you going to pay them? <laughs> well, you can, you can ask your you can ask your representatives on the board to convey that view, and I can do the same. I mean, I can do, I can uh, put that view to you UK members and say if people think it's uh, think that the, the pay is actually too high, and say that. They're the ones who say it. I'm not on the board. Be time for questions at the end. <laughs> okay, final question is Dr. Gareth um, Endicott from Geography and Planning. Hello, Colin. <coughs> what leadership will you show in the coming weeks to restore trust between you and the university management and the frontline lecturing, research, and professional services staff? to give the impression that uh, I'm working against you. I, I really don't want to be doing that. I, I don't feel as if I've been doing that. And I can, I can see that that's what you do feel. Uh, the, the, the problem is just what is, the, what is the answer to this? And I keep coming back to, you know, the, the question that I face is that how do we resolve this without a big rise in cost for the university? Because that will cause a whole slew of problems that we really don't want, you know? I mean, two or three percent, would uh, cost us what, you know, three, four million pounds. Now, we've gone to an awful lot of trouble. I sat on the diamond with you and we spent two and a half years working out how are we going to be able to fund Welsh universities uh, in a way that's, you know, at least a little bit closer to our colleagues um, in England. Uh, and we've managed to get a situation where the Welsh Government said that they would start um, helping to fund science and engineering teaching, which is much more expensive than, um, you know, other types of teaching. You know, that, that kind of rise would wipe that out straight away before we even got a chance to help the, those areas in science and engineering that would, would really need that. So if there's a way of doing this without having a big rising cost, I mean, ideally any rising costs, that would be much, much better for us. And that's what I've been trying to achieve. Well, not I've been trying to achieve, I've been arguing for. Okay, I've a question that was sent to the chair by a tweet. Um, apparently, um, this morning, the Vice Chancellor of the University of um, Aberdeen has apologised to his staff in relation to the threats for 100% pay deduction in relation to action short of a strike. Will you also be withdrawing that policy and apologising to staff for the threats? <laughs> I think it's better to, I think it's better to see how things pan out. You know, I, I know that you want, I know that you want the best of your students. You don't want to, you know, if at all possible, nobody, none of you here wants to be damaging the interests of students. And I just think it's better to wait and see what happens and uh, just work our way through it. And let, let's hope we don't get to actually sure that's right. Let's hope we can resolve this through, through discussions that, that are happening right now. Well, Action Children's Strike is working to contract, mm. right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it was clearly set out by UCU what Action Children's Strike was. I think there were four items in there. Okay, we have 18 minutes left on my timer, and I will take um, some questions from the floor. Um, we've got to start at the back there with my colleague, Tim. Thanks, Vice Chancellor. Given what you heard today about the pittance we're to receive in our old age and our wage reductions, can you tell us why anybody would want to work in the academic sector? <laughs> why, why should I encourage my children to work in academia? Well, I mean, still, I, I, I still, I, I came into it at a time 
um, in the mid 80s, I and mean, it was incredibly precarious. I mean, I didn't, I don't know why I did it. Uh, I did it because I loved German and really wanted, and I, I didn't really think about it that much. I just loved the subject, and I loved the idea that I would get to teach German and research it. And I can't, I can only look at it from my own point of view. I didn't have a permanent job for the first five years. I was in Swansea in the mid 80s. Um, and I don't know what the arguments would have been. It was a crazy thing to do then. Uh, possibly even crazier now, but I, th I hope that people would still want, would still feel that same, that same sense, and pe perhaps they won't. Perhaps the, you know, the prospects of um, not having a, a, a DB pension, if that's what, if that's where we end up, uh, might put them off. But don't forget, there are other potential options out there. I mean, the ECU itself, I think, has proposed that why don't we look at moving to um, a collective-defined uh, contribution scheme or defined ambition scheme where all the pension pots are, are pooled in one, and the, the idea is that you then aim at a certain level so you have more of a, more of a, a guarantee, which is used in, in other countries in, um, in Europe, which would require a, a change in the law if that were to happen, but that's something that we, we could obviously pick up, and I know the UK are open to that as well. So let's hope that you know this isn't the last word on it, that there is actually a way of uh, moving to a position which isn't as detrimental as the one that we're facing right now. Other questions? Okay. So, lady here, please. Hello, lady here. Hello, as an undergraduate student um, in School of Social Science, um, I don't want to have to think that my lecturers are going to be penalised for not having produced, um, carried out the lectures they're supposed to. I don't want them fined or having their salary reduced. And I think all the student body feel the same. Is that going to be the case in Cardiff? Now, I, I really think, we, I, I think the way to handle this is to look at what the issues are in each school. And uh, heads of school, I think, will we'll deal with those. But I. You know, it, I, I really hope we don't get to that point. I don't, I don't want to be at that point, but it's very difficult to say right now how we would react in, uh, in that situation if, if we got there. I think it's just very difficult to say that. Thanks. I think listening to the uh, discussions today, very useful discussions, I think what we're asking for very clearly is for you to urgently request on our behalf that Universities UK carry out a logical revaluation of the USS pension scheme as a multi-employer scheme. I think what we would like is to have a clear commitment from you. Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. but I think we would like you to produce the public state in the same way that other vice chancellors yes. have. Yes. 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 We should hang on that exactly this. <laughs> now, my question relates to the affordability argument. Mm -hmm. Now, it strikes me that you describe the logic of unsustainability very well. That makes you also sympathetic to our demands, but you can't quite get around to it. Now, the logic of uh, unsustainability is so well known to us. We have external uh, factors which are beyond our control. We force our hands and we have to tighten our belts. Now, this is an endemic logic since 2008 that is even incessant. Now, if, this, if we are in touch of picket, so if, if we square the circle, 
if we are this logical find sustainability, why don't you join us and say, this is now a step too far. We don't cut this pension board. On the contrary, we start, under your leadership, a new debate about pension schemes that are affordable. Public pension schemes, for example. We don't need to go to Utopia. We can look to Austria, for example, in that respect. Why not shifting the coordinates of that debate and make it, make it then real? Yeah. In the long term, understandable. Yeah. yeah, I'll ask Rob to respond in a moment. I mean, obviously, our, I mean, somebody's proposed uh, asking the, the government to back the USS pension, for example. I mean, that means giving them, giving the Treasury your pension fund. Yeah? <laughs> 65 billion pounds. It doesn't mean that at all. Do you know that? Yes. Oh, it doesn't yeah. mean that okay. at all. Well, Starting such a debate election. in university. Oh, see, I know. I think that's on my yeah. I think that's, that is on my I did address that in one of the emails. Can I just say, by the way, that um, I have on several occasions talked to people. Did I say that at the beginning? I can't yeah. remember. Yeah, okay. So <coughs> it's the first time, although it's certainly the, uh, the most taxing time. So. Just, uh, just to sort of follow up on your question, and thank you for that question. I think um, from a from a financial sustainability perspective of the university, we obviously have to balance, like like all of us have to do in our private lives, um, our income and our expenditure. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I think you've you've rightly raised is whether we should think about what the next stage of pension uh, should be for uh, staff uh, in universities, and uh, that is one of the options that is on the table at the moment to actually use the next three years between now and the next valuation to actually think through that. And that's not something that's going to happen very quickly. You'll appreciate that these things do take a little bit of time. But that's one of the options that is there uh, and one of the undertakings that's been given. Yep. Yeah. Uh, wait, 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 wait a second. One over here first, please. Hi, I'm Gabrielle. <coughs> Thank you very Thanks. much, Professor Rodin, again for coming today. Um, I think I just want to make a statement first of all, and that's to say I feel very sad that I've out on strike. Um, I never imagined that in my career I would ever do this at all. I'm an accountant by trade and a business manager now. And what I would really like to see from you is some moral leadership, some real honesty and integrity and engagement and utilisation of the expertise of your staff in this university. That's yeah. what I would really yeah. like. A financial question really um, around the monies that are spent on capital investment and in infrastructure. Whilst I appreciate that that's capital monies and it's different to revenue, there are still revenue consequences of having nice new shiny buildings. They cost money, they come out of the budget, and they therefore, when we talk about affordability or you talk about affordability and pension contributions, then the amount of money that's available to be able to increase the pension contributions is being taken up in part by these new investments and their revenue consequences. You mentioned that you would assess the value for money that that capital investment makes. How do you do that? How is that reported within the university? Thank you. I'll just answer the first bit and um, pass to uh, Rob. And, and, and to say that I was asked, you see, you did ask, or maybe the professor, professor's group did ask uh, some, I don't know, maybe a month ago, to, you know, for us to set up a group and use the expertise, which we actually have done. And, you know, that will meet, I'm sure, as, as soon as it can. It should have met last Thursday, as I've said. So, uh, so we are doing that. You're absolutely right that uh, when you invest in new buildings, um, uh, you, you do incur additional revenue costs. And obviously one of the things that we have to do is to uh, balance that with all the other demands that are placed upon the university. Uh, but the one thing that does happen with all our capital investments and, and, uh, uh, is that all investment cases before they're, they're approved uh, have to demonstrate that they are delivering not only uh, a financial return for the university, uh, but also the appropriate academic and research returns that are important for the university. Um, and that's the basis upon which then uh, decisions are made about uh, undertaking investments. So I would just say <coughs> that uh, we're not just investing in new buildings, we are investing in making sure that some of the facilities 
that support staff uh, and that uh, support students uh, are also renewed as part of this process. Hi, Tra Trevor Dale from the School of Bioscience. Um, do you think uh, you, you got it wrong? Um, should you have um, come out much earlier and uh, instead of describing everything as um, a chance to reassess assumptions, calling for uh, investigations into the, uh, the funding models and so on, should you not have come out right at the start and said, that, um, put the effort in, put the expertise, put the contacts that you have uh, throughout the country to the defence of our pensions, rather than belatedly coming here and saying that you're going to do something now when you see the trouble that's being caused. Yeah. Well, well, perhaps, but I had absolutely no reason to believe that um, that work hadn't already been done, because don't forget, you know, this has been going on now for many, many years, since 2011. Uh, and it just, I mean, I said at the time, it, it, it seemed to me if there was a solution out there, surely we'd know about it because nobody would want to be in this position. Um, we, didn't, we don't want to be in the position, you don't want to be in this position, the students don't want us, nor the, probably not that the country want all this happening. So if there is a solution out there, it's just a question of why it's not been found. And I'm still puzzled. Are you, are you going to go to UCU? So not to. Are you going to go to UUK and get publicly uh, declared to them that they must find a solution to this in line with the uh, the various actuarial uh, assumptions that are out there? The new valuation. Are you going to publicly de declare that you're going to go for a new valuation and argue for that now? That's not your UK, that's USS. So US, US, yeah. you well, the USS have a fiduciary duty. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, I would very much hope that if there is another way of, of, of resolving this via a revaluation, that that will happen. And we, we've heard that, you know, the proposal that that, that might be the case. I, what I still don't understand is why, if that is the case, why it hasn't happened. I don't know what advantage there'd be to USS in not doing that, but we'll see. Um, I just Will you call upon them to do that, Vice Chancellor? I, I think I, I think I've already said that. Issue a special press release. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just want to provide some numbers. Yeah. Um, in yeah. March 2017, uh, the uh, USS report says that uh, the scheme is 12.7 billion pounds deficit. Six months later, this deficit shrinks by. 60% to 5.1 billion pounds, right? And then they say the best estimate is surplus, 8.3 billion. Use common sense. What are the factors driving our liabilities? Longevity, inflation. Do they change that much in six months time? So I can assure you the valuation is a flaw. Just give me a little bit of time, I will show it to you. Thank you. Okay, I mean, I think, you know, if, if that's the case, USS need to know about it. You do have three representatives on, ECU has three representatives on the USS board. They've been close to these discussions the whole time. You know, you can talk to them, you can get them to the view, you can find out from them what the issue is. It's not just the UK. Okay, so we have a bit of time. We've got a question from Darth over here as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good thing, Colin. Thank you for coming. I want to do that one. Um, the, uh, uh, Patrick Sutton from Physics. Um, I, I'd like to say, I, I think a lot of the frustration you're sensing in the room comes from a sense among those assembled that you're not being proactive enough in engaging with, with the problems here. Um, for example, you've been asked several times. <laughs> you've been asked several times now, will you issue a public statement asking for a, re a, a reassessment of, of the situation? Uh, you were asked earlier about the, the, the income of the people who sit on the USS Pensions Board, and your response was that you're not a UK representative. But you are the VC of the Russell Group University. You can write to those representatives. You know who they are. You can push that along to fellow VCs. Earlier, you had said the Welsh government had cut funding, and you said you didn't complain. 
I submit it's your job as the Vice Chancellor to complain and to push the best <laughs> civil rights you're, you're, you have You have the influence that anybody else in this room. Uh, the very little we can do, we stand up on the picket lines in freezing cold, we post photos of ourselves wearing silly masks, you know, <laughs> we tweet. You can do a lot more than we can, and so we're asking you to help us. Yeah. Thank you. If, that, but if, if we can solve this, and I've said this right at the start, if we can solve this by changing the, the, by, or, you know, if the methodology is flawed, uh, then, it, then it really has to be addressed because it would be absolutely mad situation to be in, in this kind of conflict over something that can be resolved relatively easily without, a bit, without any increase in cost, and in fact, um, apparently a reduction in cost. That would be fantastic. And in terms of complaining to the Welsh Government, I complain very loudly and bitterly to them, and you know, cause a, a whole lot of kerfuffle. Um, when was it? Two years ago or so, when the when the proposal was to uh, you know, make big cuts to university budgets, which would have had an absolutely devastating effect on this university. Forty million of cuts were fended off. So please, you know, understand that I do fight for this university. And I do fight for you. The reason I didn't complain about this one is because that was all part of an agreement that will move through this period into. You know, a new a new period of, of university funding through the Diamond Review, and my main concern there was not to have to take drastic, uh, irreversible measures within Cardiff University, which is why we've much to Rob Chagrin. You know, we was actually run a deficit last year, running a bigger deficit this year. We are council expects us to get to a break-even position next year. That is not going to be easy. If we do get another rising cost, it's going to be even more difficult and, and, and you know my main aim is to get the university through this without dramatic uh, effects and I think you can guess what those might be and I don't want to go down that route and I've really done work very hard to protect this uni university from that and don't think there aren't voices telling me I ought to be doing more uh, to you know to save money to, to cut the cost base there are and I've not done that, and I don't want to do it. So I don't want to be pushed into a position where I have to do it. Okay, I'm afraid there was time for no more questions. That's an error, and uh, I think we've taken up enough of your time. As a, as a final comment, we would like you to put more pressure on UUK in a public forum and uh, to, co to, to call for more negotiations. I think that's probably our final comment. Tell them uh, to open up the, the, the negotiating aspect. They went into negotiations saying they weren't prepared to change the current pension system as it was proposed. And they said they weren't prepared to talk to UCU about that. If they're prepared to do that, that's a step forward. Okay. I, 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 want, to call, I want to call this to a halt. I want to thank Colin for coming. I would like you to give him a round of applause. I want to thank everybody who made the meeting possible in terms of asking questions and, and the work beforehand. And um, I think we should let the Vice Chancellor off the hook for now. <laughs>